of three can go to the back at this time. And for the rest of us in here, we're going to continue in the book of Colossians. Today we are in chapter two. And uh, I'm going to preach on verses 11 through 15. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles in the seat backs that you can borrow. Um, for the sake of context, I'm going to read from uh, verse 8 all the way through 15. So this is Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 15. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried in him or with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful workings of God, who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That is the word of God. Amen. Now, here in our text, um, we, we are basically walking through uh, this section of passage and we are seeing how uh, Paul is helping the church to cope with a false doctrine that is being taught within the church. If you look back at the letter, if you look back at the history of the letter, it's hard to determine how much of influence his teaching has had already up to this point. It hasn't had enough influence to derail this church, but it, all, it has had enough influence within the church for Paul to be concerned. Epaphras had gone and seen Paul in prison and told him about what was going on within this church in Colossae. And Paul wrote this letter to the church, warning them uh, to stand firm in their faith and in their belief and to fight this, uh, this heretical teaching. And so here in this part of the letter, Paul spends some time talking about how uh, they should be aware of what is false and then also how to combat it. So Paul is warning the church about this particular false teaching that had gained some sort of influence within their fellowship. As I said, we there's no way of knowing how much influence, but it was a threat. And Paul prayed that they would be encouraged, that they would be knit together, and that ultimately that they would grow in the knowledge of Christ. And we've, we've talked about that. That's verses 1 through 3. He also wanted... This so that they would not be deceived through persuasive arguments that were not founded on truth. And we also talked about that in verse 4. But further in Colossians chapter 2, Paul warned the church against the false teachings of philosophy, which has already been preached on. This empty knowledge, persuasive language. That leads to nothing because it's not founded on Christ. He warns the church not only of this, the, the dangers of philosophy and, and accepting that as doctrine, but also legalism, which we'll talk about today. And then also mysticism. So in verses 6 through 10, Paul told the church to guard themselves against these by, by doing certain things. In verse 6. He told them to remember the word as received through the apostles. In other words, don't forget the gospel. The gospel does not change. The gospel is cemented in Christ. There is no need to add to it or to take away from it. In the gospel, God has given us what we need for life and godliness. That is the continual teaching of the Bible 
And that is certainly the continual teaching of Paul. When we are struggling in life, when we need to be reminded of God's grace, when we need strength for tomorrow, when we need correction, when we need anything pertaining to this life, we are to remember the word as received by the apostles and given to us. But then he also said that we need to walk according to the gospel. It's one thing to hear it, but it's another thing to walk in obedience to it. It says in verse 7, it's important that we walk according to the gospel that we were taught. There are a lot of people who like information. They love learning things and they love to read or, or, or watch things in order so that they can learn. The gospel is more important for us than just learning it. The gospel and the point of the gospel is for us to learn it and then to walk according to it. To remind ourselves of it. And then Paul says in verse 8, he commands them actually. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy or empty deceit. Paul's conclusion in verses 9 and 10 of this chapter is that they must cling to Christ because truth is only found in him. Why? Well, we talked about this last week. I said that the only reason or the, the, the reason why only truth is found in Christ is because he is God. Look at word, Paul's words in Colossians 2 verses 9 and 10. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. When I read that verse. It's a very important piece of advice for the Christian. Especially when we talk about Christian living. Christ is the source of. Of all truth. No new knowledge. Should take us away. From him. Everything that we learn in this life. Everything that we hold dear to our hearts. Everything that we accept as doctrine. To glorify him first and foremost. Not ourselves. Well in our passage today. Paul takes aim at the sin of legalism. He talks about, or really, he, he talks about it without really specifically talking about it. And it's really neat how he does it. But the main point of Paul's teaching is to teach us how the pursuit of righteousness, for righteousness sake, is an empty practice. As Christians, we, we want to grow. We, we want to be sanctified. And, and we want to glorify God. But it can't just be for the sake of being holy. It can't just be for the sake of elevating ourselves. It all has to be for the glory of God. It all has to be done to honor God. So, yes, pursuing righteousness for righteousness sake is an empty practice. In fact, it is a sinful practice. It it falls under the realm of what we would call legalism. Instead, we as Christians must look to Christ for our righteousness because he is the founder and he is the perfecter of our faith. We cannot add anything to what Christ has already done. So what I want to do in this passage is that there's four statements, and I want to call them the in him statements, our statements. Paul uses these statements to, to really show us where our righteousness comes from. He uses these statements to show us that it's not found in us, but only in Christ. The very first one comes in verse 11. He says, in him, verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. In other words, in him you are made holy. See, the good news of the gospel for the Gentiles here in this church in Colossae was that they were included within God's people. They were counted as God's people. And not only that, but they were marked as so. 
That was great news for the Gentiles. Because in the Old Testament, the Israelites were considered God's people. They were actually set apart from all the other nations. And they were set apart and they were identified by the act of physical circumcision. By the cutting of the male's foreskin. That sign served as an outward appearance or an outward sign of their allegiance to God. In other words, when someone was circumcised and they were marked in that way, what that said was God was their God and they were his people. That was part of the covenant agreement that God had with the nation of Israel. Well, we fast forward to the New Testament and Paul is using the same argument here for the Gentiles. But the circumcision that he is speaking about is different. The cutting of the foreskin was no longer necessary for anyone. Because when they believed, they were cut to the heart already. In fact, from a spiritual standpoint, it was God who had changed their hearts. And it was a circumcision done without human hands. This was solely done by God, and therefore Paul says it was made without hands at all. The Bible reflects this in several different places, but Paul goes into more detail in Romans chapter 2. I want to read this to you. This is verses 28 and 29. Paul says, For there is for no one is a Jew who is merely outwardly. The Old Testament based everything as far as identifying God's people on outward appearance. If you were born a Jew and if you were circumcised. But here Paul saying, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. Nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the Spirit, not by the letter, his praise is not from men, but from God. Paul also taught in the book of Galatians. He says, there is no special race. There is no Jew or Greek, or rather Jew or Gentile, for all are one in Christ. Point of verse 11 here in Colossians chapter 2 is that in Christ, the Christians in Colossae were set apart as holy for God by God. That's what's important for us to realize. For them, there was no act that they performed to be initiated into the faith. God had changed their hearts and it was so. I'm so grateful for that. I stand before you just completely grateful for God's grace. Because the same is true for you and for me. There's nothing that we have to do in order to meet some rigorous commandment in order to be saved. We do not ourselves have to achieve perfection because if we did, it would be an endless chase. There is nothing that we have to do to add to the sacrifice that Christ has already given for us. God simply gave us the gift of faith. We believe God changed our hearts and it was so. When some ask what they must do other than believe to be a Christian. And, and I've had that question from time to time. I like to mess with them a little bit. Just to add some humor to the conversation, but also to help them to realize 
everything has already been done. But some will ask this, and then also some will ask this pertaining to joining the church. What is it that I have to do to, 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 to be a Christian other than believe? Or what is it that I have to do to join the church and other, be, other than be a Christian? And I tell them, well, you know what? It's blood in and it's blood out. Yeah. If you want to be a Christian or if you want to be a member of our church, what we do is we get pillowcases and we fill them up with rocks and stones. We all line up and you have to walk down this this aisle and everybody gets to hit you. And if you make it to the other side, you are part of the body of Christ. Sounds ridiculous, right? No one would sign up for that. The truth is, it is blood in, but it's not our blood. It's the blood of Christ that's already been spilt on our behalf. See, the truth is you were made a Christian at the point of your conversion. Thank God there's nothing else that we have to do to put a stamp on what God has already done. When God changed your heart, he changed you. And for those who are in Christ, the Bible says this. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are a people for his own possession. That you may proclaim excellence, the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into this are his marvelous light. Thank God that he is the one who sets us aside. He is the one who marks us as holy. And thank God there's nothing else that we have to do in order to be saved. But Paul, Paul continues, verses 12 and 13. The next in him statement here is, in him you are raised to a new life. See, because here Paul helps the Christians in Colossae to reflect on the act and the meaning of their baptism. He says in verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were all or you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful workings of God who raised him from the dead. Now, the statement here, having been buried with him in baptism, is very important. In fact, for me, it supports the fact that throughout Christian history, the act of baptism followed the profession of the believer's faith. Paul very systematically talks about this because he talks about the circumcision done without hands. He talks about the circumcision done by Christ. And then he systematically goes to the act of baptism. There is no baptism without belief. So here he tells them in the same way that you've been buried with him in baptism. Well, that does follow someone's profession of faith. In other words, because God had changed their hearts, they were baptized in order to be obedient to God's command. The baptism that they experience is the same as ours. I think that's one of the neat things about the ordinances. They are ordinary in practice, meaning... We, in order to celebrate the Lord's Supper, we eat bread and drink wine. In order to celebrate the ordinance of baptism, all it takes is enough water to dip a person. Or not dip, but submerge a person, excuse me. They're very ordinary in practice. But extraordinary in meaning. Both of them paint a picture for us of what Christ has done. Specifically, baptism. It's an outward expression of the circumcision that God has already performed on our hearts. As I said before, God is the one who has changed us. And when we are baptized, we are showing or illustrating the change that has taken place. 
That is why the person should be fully submerged. The submersion illustrates having been buried with him, as Paul says here in this chapter. Rising from the water illustrates us having been raised with him to a new life. Paul reiterated the fact that once a person's heart is changed by God, then they are a new creation. How? By putting off the body of the flesh, as he says here in this chapter. Those who were dead in their trespasses before Christ, the Bible proclaims, are made alive together with him. Again, all done by God. The act of baptism does not save us, but it openly and joyfully professes what God has done. Brother or sister, I want to tell you that the old you is gone. The new you is here. You may not be who you're supposed to be, but you will never be who you were. All by the grace of God. Then in verse 14, here is another in him, either statement or, or thought. Verse 14 Paul points us directly to the cross. And he lets us realize, or he pushes us to realize, that in him the records of our sins are canceled. Paul reminds the Christians in Colossae that by virtue of their faith in Christ, their previous, and this is the good part, and future trespasses, have been forgiven in Christ. You know, it's one thing for our, our past to be forgiven, and I'm grateful for that. I speak from experience with a person that had a dark past. But I'm not the only one in here. In fact, I would say we've all had a dark past. But our previous sins have been covered over by the blood of Christ. And though we live today, we don't live without sin. We still commit sin. And whatever sin we commit is also covered by the blood of Christ. It's okay to say that. It doesn't sound right. It sounds off a little bit. It's almost like if, Pastor, don't say that so that people won't sin. Well, Paul talked about that in the book of Romans. It's true, though. We have a hard time understanding grace because it's beyond our own human comprehension. Since the first covenant was established according to the law, we're used to demanding perfection. We look at the law, we look at ourselves, and we realize, I can't live up to that. Paul talks about this here in verse 14 as well. See, when someone broke the law, it counted as a mark against them. That mark couldn't be removed until Christ came. This I can relate to. As a kid growing up, especially if you're around the age group of, I would say, maybe 35 to 50 or maybe even older. You will remember in school that whenever you got in trouble, your name was written on the chalkboard, right? It was written on the chalkboard. Everybody could see. Maybe you had three chances, but every time you did something you weren't supposed to, there was a, a mark up there for the rest of the day. Some teachers... If you were good, they would erase the mark against you. But most teachers just kept it up there. And anytime you messed up during the day, another mark went up and another mark went up. I was very familiar with that practice. My name had a mark on it 
often. As I think about my life now, and I look at my past, there is an endless amount of marks against me. So many I cannot count. Not a single one could I erase by my good behavior. Not a single one could I convince God of taking it off. It was an endless pursuit of righteousness. I would never achieve it on my own. I needed somebody who was worthy to come and to, to appease the wrath of God in order to take off those marks from my name. That was Christ. See, those who break the law today without the cleansing faith of Christ, they still have marks against them. And for every mark, the Bible says they will have to answer for. But the good news of the gospel for those who are in Christ says this. Romans 8 verses 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, your marks have been erased. I don't think everybody's awake in here, right? Unless you lived a good life, I think you should be pretty excited about that. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Your marks have been taken away. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteousness or that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who walk not, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You know, I think many times in life we don't understand the gravity of that verse. Nor do we understand the gravity or the uniqueness of what Christ did for us on the cross. I think on a daily basis we brush it off and we just forget about it. You know how I know? I know this because of how we treat life, how our disposition is in life, how we feel sorry for ourselves, how we throw pity parties most of the days, not realizing that just being in Christ, we have already, we have already won. Just being in Christ, we are already blessed. You know, we begin to realize what Christ has done for us whenever our life is on the line. That's when we start to realize it. When our days are growing shorter. When we know we're going to meet our maker. When we've been given a, a life a sentence, if you will. Then we think about the grace of God. Then we appreciate what Christ has done. Brother and sister, don't wait until that day. As Paul says, remember the gospel. Every day, no matter what is happening to you, you are blessed because you belong to him. You are blessed because the marks against you have been erased. Not by your own doing, but by what Christ has done for you. As I read that, and I try to understand God's grace, I, I have some questions. Well, did I get away with sin? Did, did God give me a pass? No. I did not get away with sin, and God did not give me a pass. But... That's why grace 
isn't free. Somebody or someone paid the awful price of my sin. Paul reminded the church in Colossae that their sin was set aside, being nailed to the cross. The only reason God has forgiven your sin is because Christ took your place on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This Substitutionary atonement took place when Jesus was nailed to the cross. He took our sin and we received his righteousness. Through this act of mercy, we come to realize that God finally and completely provided a way for sinners like you and me to be saved. And the wonderful thing about that is that no one can take that away from us. And no one can separate us from the love of God. Now, notice I've said very little about legalism here. And this is what I mean about how Paul does this. I, I, I think it's awesome is that Paul refutes legalism by Exposing what the gospel preaches, what the gospel teaches. I think before we come to know what legalism is, we have to know what the gospel is. Because knowing what the gospel is will help us in our fight against legalism. And there's a, there's a fourth point here, and I want to use it as a conclusion. Because here in... The very last verse, verse 15, Paul says, speaking of Christ, that he, disar he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I want to summarize that in my own words for this final point. In him... God truly conquered over all things. And in doing so, made us more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want you to notice that everything I've mentioned has been done in him and not by you. That's grace. And that's the God that we serve. You see, in order for you to gain acceptance before God, the Bible is very explicit. You only need Christ. God has already accepted you when you have believed upon Christ. Though you are still being sanctified, the Bible says you are already filled in him. I think what Paul provided to the Christians in Colossae with this writing was um, essential to their faith. It's, what, what he provided to them was the gospel. And whatever false doctrine of works was being taught, Paul was writing them to say, Christ did it all and he paid it all. It seems that some sort of legalism had really grabbed onto a few. In other words, it, it, filter, it, it infiltrated the church and Paul wanted to squash it before it became a real massive issue. When we look at the whole topic of legalism, we must understand that it is very destructive. That it is a false doctrine because it takes us away from the teachings of the gospel. And many times we are being legalistic 
without us even realizing it. In fact, many times legalism is celebrated as being above and beyond. And that's something that as Americans, we like to pursue. We don't like just to meet the mark. We want to go above and beyond. I remember in school when you made 100, you were happy with that. But somebody always had to make 105, right? You stood there and you were thinking, well, I was happy with my 100 until I saw her 105. Now, now I want 105. Or you hear the athletes, they gave it above 100%, right? Not 100% wasn't good enough, but we 110%. That's how much we try. That's how much we hustle. I'm like, you didn't even do probably 10% of what the body would allow you to do. We always want to go above and beyond. So a lot of times legalism is celebrated because someone seems like, oh, they're more holy. Oh, this is what God's commandment says. So then they're going to do this. So then that paints them in a different picture that sets them apart from the regular Christians. We're always trying to achieve perfection. We're always trying to achieve being the best. In other words, well, Legalism is destructive because it takes us away from the original intent of God's word. It destroys many lives. And I would say that it has, legalism has solidified itself in many churches. But the problem with it is that it adds or takes away from what God has truly said. R.C. Sproul defines legalism in this way, and this is what I love about R.C. Sproul's teaching. Even though he was a brilliant man, he had a gift for being able to say something very simple. As far as current day theologians, he was probably the most brilliant. But if you go back and listen to any R.C. Sproul sermon, he's going he's gonna to give you, he's going to break down the passage for you. He's going to exegete it going to give you illustrations that really go with what he's teaching on. He's going to apply it to your life. He's going to wrap it all up. He's going to use words that I've never heard of, but he uses them so easily. And, and, and then he explains them so well. He does this all in 23 minutes. It's awesome. It, it's, it's like seeing a, 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 a master craftsman work. And this is what R.C. Sproul says of legalism. It says, basically, legalism involves abstracting the law of God from its original context. So simple, yet so profound. That's what legalism is. In the New Testament, Jesus dealt swiftly with legalism. He tells the Pharisees, Sadducees and the teachers of the law, Matthew 15, verses 8 through 9. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Here we are, there are these 110% people who see the word of God for what it is and they want to go above and beyond it. And then they also want to put that yoke of burden on everybody else. To that, Jesus says, your worship is in vain. In other words, your worship is empty because you are not doing it for the glory of God. You are doing it for the glory of self. Instead, Jesus says this to those who want to follow him. Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we look at the sin of legalism, we must accept it for what it is. It is aimed to exalt oneself while true worship and adherence to God's word seeks to exalt God. How can we tell if we are being legalistic? Well, first of all, it's in our attitude and how we look at others. If we do not see the plank in our eye, then there is a problem with our hearts. Because some will say, well, you are, you are holding me to a standard that God has held me to, so then therefore you're being legalistic. In other words, oh, you're calling out my sin, and because you're calling out my sin, you're judging me, and you're being legalistic. No, my friends, that is not, being, that is not legalism. Now, you could be doing it in an unmerciful way, but calling sin, sin is not legalistic. What is legalistic is when you are calling sin that is not sin. And, and no matter what God's word says about it, you are convinced it is sin. So then therefore, others who do not agree to the same standard that you hold or do not practice the same practices that you that you practice, you see it as sin for everybody else. You think, well, even though God's word doesn't go this far, I think everybody else should do this because it's the right thing to do. Well, if it's the right thing for you, then that is great. That's awesome. I'm glad and grateful you have that conviction. But you have no right no one does to hold everybody else to that same standard. God is the only one who can say what is right and what is wrong. We are vessels who carry the truth. But see, legalism destroys that. Legalism destroys fellowship. It destroys relationships. It destroys true doctrines, or at least it attempts to. There's chaos wherever there is legalism. Why? Because the measuring stick is always moving. It's always moving. Why? Because it's based on somebody's opinion. Our doctrine, rather, our conviction should not be founded on our own opinion, should be founded on the word of God. Because that does not change. Why? Because God does not change. That's why I say that legalism is aimed at exalting oneself while true worship seeks to exalt God. Legalism says everyone should be as I am. True worship recognizes that the best version of ourselves is falling, or the best, the best version of us is falling. There's nothing that we can do to earn God's grace. And I know it's hard. It's hard to think that, well, if I just do something a little extra, God will be that much more happier with me, and, and, and I will be set apart from everybody else. It's just not true. You weren't saved because you're special. I know some are used to hearing that. And in, in, in many churches that is preached. Because the preacher wants people to come up to the altar. Because the preacher so desperately wants somebody to accept Christ. He says, you know what? You are so special. God is, God is lucky to have you in a sense. I, I can't stand here and act like I've never done that before. I've committed that sin plenty of times as well. Trying to change the hearts and minds of God's people when I had no right in doing so 
Only the Spirit can do that. I'm not going to tell you that you're special. In fact, I'll tell you the opposite. You're wretched. There was no reason for God to save you except for his own mercy and grace. All the blessings you've received in life, you don't deserve them. And if they are all taken away from you, God has no guilt on him. How can we accuse God of not treating us fairly whenever he has given us so much already? More than, than we deserve. There's all sorts and forms of legalism. I think we'd be surprised if we really sat down and looked at our lives and we'd see how legalistic we are. If not in doctrine, then in practice. But to me, one leads the other, so it doesn't really matter. The Bible proclaims, for by grace you have been saved through faith. doesn't say, for by grace you have been saved through your own works, right? Because it wouldn't be grace at all. For those of us who are always pursuing perfection, perfection in mind and body, that doesn't apply to the spirit. Perfection is only found in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. In closing, I just want to say this. I think there's so much that I really wanted to say about this topic, and there's so much that could be said. But I think we get the picture. I think we need to check ourselves on a daily basis. And ask ourselves, are we truly seeking to glorify God in our words, thoughts, and actions? Are we truly holding people to the standard for which God has given or our own standard? Yeah, I have an opinion about a lot of things. I have an opinion about a lot of people. How I wish they would be or what I wish they would say or how I wish they would dress or whatever. But does my opinion really matter? Have they sinned against God? Because that's what really matters. To combat legalism, I think we should remember the five solas of the Reformation. Not that these were taught all together within the Reformation. Rather, this was the heart and the thought process of the Reformation. That we were saved by faith alone. There was no works that we had done or could do. Faith in itself was, and it is a gift. So we are saved by faith alone. By the scriptures alone. We weren't smart enough. We weren't special enough to come to saving faith. We were brought to faith through the gospel. This was done through Christ alone. By God's grace alone. And to the glory of God alone. Let us pray.